made a discovery three years into my doctoral program, and this discovery absolutely changed my life. I discovered that unlike my colleagues in the counseling psychology program, I didn't enjoy working with people who had emotional problems. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Um, <clears throat> it's a bit of a drawback if you want to be a counseling psychologist. God bless the people who do that work. It's wonderful work. I found it emotionally draining. Um, and so I found myself thinking, I want to be a psychologist. I want to help people with their problems. But I need to work with a healthier population. I need to work with rational people. And this was about 1997. Do you remember what the investing environment was like in 1997? It's unbelievable. Um, and I thought, you know, investors, that would be a nice rational population for me to work with. You know, they make uh, decisions to buy and sell. They're probably analytical like me. I think some of you can appreciate the irony in my decision-making choices for my career. Because the fact of the matter is there is nothing more emotional and less rational than the relationship that people have with their money. Um, I also often speak about gambling. I am an avid poker player, and I enjoy those things. If people are sticking around afterwards, feel free to ask me about that. I'm only going to touch on that subject today. Um, <clears throat> and uh, just a few things before we get started. Most of my work, actually I can go to the next slide. Most of my work, this thing, make sure I got this thing right. calling an audible here. <laughs> All right. Yeah, if you can make that work, that's great. I mean, it's not, it's not really important. Most of my work is done with financial advisors. Um, my, my firm um, works with all sorts of clients. That's my personal specialty. So what you will notice in this presentation is a lot of what I speak about is actually geared with the, those people in mind. Uh, also, uh, you know, we, we just had a nice dinner. It, it's uh, a little bit past 7.30 at night. I want to make this a, a rather light presentation. I mean, it's going to be weighty academic material, but hopefully we're going to have some fun with it. Um, it's designed to be interactive. It's designed to be enjoyable, maybe even have a few laughs along the way. Uh, towards that end, I want to engage you in an exercise, a brief warm-up exercise to get your brains working. Uh, basically, it, it's, a, it's a rather simple task. I want you to name the color of the letters you see on the subsequent slides. I want you to verbalize the color that you see as quickly and as loudly as you can. Are you ready? Here we go. Slide number one. All right, that's actually pretty good. I want a little louder, a little faster. Let's roll through it. What color do you see? Red. Nice. Green. Perfect. Yellow. Bingo. Red. All right. Blue. Right. Perfect. Yes. Aha, good. Yellow. Nice. Blue. I see it. Brown. Okay. That was a version of what is called the Stroop test. It's a cognitive functioning test. Um, used in, in a lot of inpatient facilities to test for brain damage and other things. Uh, Gary Busey is not part of the Stroop test. I, I added that because I like the freak out factor at the end there. Um, what we just did there, and that exercise is, is an example of, of several things. Um, one, it, but it all boils down to a concept called neuroplasticity, which is a really fancy way of saying rewiring your brain, making new pathways in your brain. I, I particularly like this slide because I think it captures what happens when people form new habits and go in different directions. If you wanted to make a path, a new path in nature, you would do it by walking down a certain place where there was no path. And if you walked enough and you continually walked along that path, the grass would wear away, and pretty soon you'd have a way to get from point A to point B. The same thing is true with our brains. This is quite literally what happens. In order to forge new neural pathways, we have to practice we have to walk that path. And of course, what happens when we stop walking those paths? They, they, they become overgrown. They end up disappearing. Uh, you may notice that at first, uh, you know, I threw, I threw you a curveball, and um, a lot of you fouled it off. Some of you swung and missed. It was designed to, be a, designed to be a trick. And by the way, that's a great rule of thumb. If anybody ever asks you to participate in a psychological experiment, just assume it's a practical joke. 
from my personal experience. It seems like that's more often than not lying at the heart of it. Um, but people got better. By the end, everybody was on board. Everybody was hitting the, the proper thing. This is relevant to investing for a lot of reasons. When it comes to the way people invest their money, a lot of times people think they're using certain cognitive functions. They're using certain parts of their brain when in fact other parts are subverting it and actually getting in the way. The ability to tease these two functions apart, the ability to make sure you're using the right parts of your brain to make your decisions is absolutely essential to long-term success. Okay. All right, today's agenda. Um, start off with an intro, a big picture. Do me a favor, raise your hand if you would say you have a working knowledge of what behavioral finance is. Go ahead and raise your hand. Okay. Some of you, not, not, not all of you, that's fine. Um, it, that, that's my field of study. It's another fancy way of saying investor psychology. Um, we're going to talk about the major investing traps that behavioral finance has identified. We're going to talk about the role of emotions, three emotions in particular. Uh, lastly, I'm going to talk about a concept I call investor identity, which lied at the heart of the book that I wrote. Um, and then just a very brief wrap-up. Uh, by way of fair warning, I have a lot of video clips I've always been told whenever you're doing presentations, the ability to insert some multimedia goes a really long way towards keeping people's attentions, keeping things light. So there's going to be a number of video clips along the way, which I, I wrote. Um, but first, I'd like for you to imagine that I am not merely a geeky psychologist who's been uh, drove across Pennsylvania to get a good night's sleep. <laughs> I want you to imagine that what I am is actually a game show host. And we're gonna play a version of the old TV game show, Deal or No Deal. And I will tell you why soon after. Who remembers this program? Is it still on the air? Is that still on, actually? Is it really? Okay, it, it, it was really hot a while back when I, I started using it in my presentation. Um, it goes something like this. You get offered a choice. I'd like for you to consider this. Imagine that this is not my computer bag. This is actually stuffed with money. And I'm here to tell you that you, each and every one of you who, for, who, who came out and decided to attend this lecture, is going to get $3,000. Right? Imagine that. You're going to get $3,000. It's already been deposited in your checkbooks, in your checking accounts. It's there. But I'm here and I offer you a gamble, a risk. I say to you, I'll tell you what, I'm going to say there's a three out of four chance that you can win an incremental $1,000. And you walk away with four grand. Here's the thing. There's a one in four chance that you lose the $3,000 that you already have. Who here would take a risk and risk the $3,000 that they already have? Raise your hand if you would gamble in that situation. You, sir, okay. Two, three, got some gamblers here. All right. Now imagine the reverse scenario, if you will. Imagine that, turns out, it costs you $3,000 to come here and listen to me talk. That money has been drained out of your checking account. It's gone, but I offer you a gamble. I say to you, I'll tell you what, there's a three out of four chance that you're going to lose the incremental thousand dollars. Turns out it could cost you four thousand. But here's the good news: you've got a one in four chance to get yourselves off the hook. It takes a little bit of imagination. That money's gone. Do you roll the dice to get yourself off the hook? Raise your hand if you would take a gamble in this instance. Okay, a lot more hands. Okay. Um, here is. What was found? In that first scenario, 80% of individuals will avoid a risk, right? They've got the money, they're happy, why, why risk losing it, okay? And mathematically, the expected value is the same, so it's an even risk. 80% of people avoid it, but in that second scenario, 90% of people will take the risk, 